Hello and welcome to Landscape Photography World, the podcast for everyone passionate about landscape photography. I'm Grant Swinburne and I'll be your host on this show, talking to landscape photographers about their motivations, likes and dislikes. Time I'm talking to Paul Colleen from Belfast in Northern Ireland. Making images throughout Ireland and abroad, Paul's passion is to capture ethereal beauty in his work, often driven by mood and emotion to create something beautiful. A purist at heart, the goal for Paul has always been to get an image right in camera. His work has been featured in various landscape photography magazine publications. He's also won World Landscape Photographer of the Year 2022. He was shortlisted in the same competition in 2020 and won UK Landscape Photographer of the Year in 2016. Paul is not only passionate about creating images to first and foremost please himself, he's passionate in helping others develop their photography, taking great satisfaction in seeing others improve and progress. We discuss how his award-winning image came about, his favourite locations around Ireland, and a whole lot more. I hope you enjoy the show. Hi Paul, welcome to the show. How are you going? Yeah, I'm good. I'm not too bad. I've had a busy day, busy family day after work. So um, it's good. It's good to get a break and come on on the show and, and have a chat about photography. Oh, thanks very much for taking the time to to do so. How about will you start with um, who you are and what got you started in landscape photography? Um, my name is Paul Colleen. I'm a landscape photographer from Belfast in Northern Ireland. Um, all of my education that I excelled in, which was just art, um, it's always been sort of geared towards photography and, and being creative and stuff. So um, after uh, secondary school, I went to college and then I went to art college and I always had a keen interest in photography and that developed on from there. I think I graduated from art college in 2003 and I fell into an office job and didn't do anything creative. And then about seven years later in 2010, I was going on city breaks with my then girlfriend, which is my wife, and I was borrowing my dad's digital SLR and taking images, which I thought were good at the time, which were not so good looking back, but just on auto, but using a, a tripod and stuff and coming home and I entered a couple of competitions in the local camera club when I joined in 2010 and didn't do too well. So I thought, right, okay. Um, let, let's get back into this sort of thing and, and see where we can go. Okay, fair enough. So is, do you find that's uh, one of your biggest motivations or you know, what, what's, I guess, behind the motivation and the desire to create um, you know, artistic photography? I think, when I, I think it's all I've ever been good at art and drawing when I was younger and then obviously going to university and I did visual communications and I find a lot of my um projects where sort of the medium i was using was photography be it pinhole be it polaroids be it uh film back in the in the day um mm -hmm. and i always use photography as a medium so i'm not sure why i had the seven year break um after our college you just fall into a job and you you know you get stuck in a rut and you're sort of you're going out and you're having fun you're, yeah life you're happens yeah. life happens yeah but joining the camera club in 2010, it sort of spurred me on. So when I went the first couple of images and didn't do too well, and I thought they were good images, I asked a couple of the advanced members for feedback and they pointed out a few criticisms. And I thought, right, okay, well, there's a couple of guys here in the advanced section that are winning all of the competitions. So I thought, I'm in here as a beginner. I've never taken a photograph on manual and I'm going to start this weekend and I'm going to focus on rising sort of through the ranks in the camera club and and being crowned advanced worker of the year so that was the target then and the goal so mm, yeah okay cool so i guess one of the things that i've always found you know and it's it's sometimes hard to get is you know if you want to improve your photography getting that advice about you know not necessarily what's wrong though that helps but what you can do to improve. How important was that advice to you in, in making some of the improvements that you've made? Yeah, when I joined the Comic Club, um, I think one of the events 
dance members in particular could see I had a passion for it and I had the eye after a couple of competitions later when I got a couple of placements in the beginner section he could see I had something and I don't know I think coming from our college I had a, a bit of a, a slight ego I've been to our college I can take a good photograph yep but when you join and you're 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 mixing with more experienced photographers you need to sort of soak up everything ones with more experience to send you just be like a sponge you know so that's what I did so I let them take me under my wing mm. we would have went out for a couple of couple of shoots every sort of month landscape shoots and I would just take their advice on board and take what they say as gospel for the first sort of year and a half two years in the club and I was rapidly improving then so I moved up to the intermediate section and I was winning competitions there as well so um yeah, I mean, I've never understood photographers who don't take on board what a more experienced and better quality photographer is saying. If, if it's going to improve your work, take it on board. You, you will eventually reach a level where you can sort of stand on your own two feet and go, well, no, well, I like this for this reason. And then you can, you, you, there's even more personal development there, but I would always take on board what somebody said. Even now, if, if somebody's coming at me as a better photographer, I would, I would take it on board. Yeah, but with yeah. open arms, you know, because why not? Uh, nobody, I don't think anybody's a finished article, you know, everybody can improve. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. And I think, you know, one of the one of the things you said there, you know, uh, around, you know, taking that advice on board is, is important. But I guess also then shaping that to your own sort of vision. Um, how have you sort of used the advice that you've got to, you know, to, to shape your style? And, you know, I guess, for, first off, how would you describe your style? We'll start there and then we'll move on to the how, how that's evolved, I guess. A lot of my landscape work would be long exposure. I've always had a thing for long exposures. So mm -hmm. probably moody long exposures would be my style. Um, yeah, it's... Um, a lot of my work would be based on more like emotion and rather like I'm, I'm not so much interested in gear. I'm not so much interested in camera settings. It doesn't really, I won't say it doesn't interest me because you need to know certain things, obviously. You yep. reach a certain level of ability, but um, I'm more about a, a mood and emotion. Like I, I, I'd be going to a location and I'd be sticking on a playlist of music and maybe that's going to sort of influence how I'm going to shoot or what I want to shoot when I get to a location. Sure. Um, lots of things would inspire me, but um, yeah, I kind of forgot the question. Now, I, I guess really wanting to understand the, uh, the the shaping of that creative vision. How have you uh, how have you started to evolve your style from where you sort of started out as in the camera club as a beginner to you know becoming you know I mean you've you've recently just won the world landscape photography competition uh run by nigel danson and um a, a few others um you know can you tell us how that image came about and how that you know has been sort of a culmination of uh that development of your style yeah that, that image it it wasn't really planned as such it was uh it was planned and it wasn't planned it was it was a lucky shot you know anybody can see that image you don't go and plan that image it just that happens and i was lucky enough to be able to set my camera settings and capture the time so the story behind the image is a wee bit emotional um one of my wife's friends Lindsay, um she suffered from a uh, brain tumor and mm -hmm. she passed away after battling cancer for five years and as a landscape photographer you know this grant you're always watching the forecast and you're watching the conditions so yep the Dark Ages is, is an iconic location that's been in Game of Thrones and all of that. I've never yeah. seen Game of Thrones, but so I'm told. Um, I've been there. Really um, hard to take a photo without people in it too. <laughs> have you been? Yeah, have you been there? Yeah, I have. Yeah. It's probably hard to take a photo of it without birds as well. Yeah. Um, <laughs> yeah. So, so Lindsay passed away on the 11th of April last year, 2021, mm. and her funeral was. Um, the 14th of April and I was just checking the weather forecast the night before the 13th and it was obviously forecast for fog and mist which is a conditions that I've always wanted to shoot a location at 
And back when I started, I, I always used to use wide angle lenses. Yep. So link and go go wide or go home, you know. And more more in more recent years, I've, I've had longer lens and stuff for using the 70 to 300. So that was one of the sort of images that I had in mind for using that lens with. Mm. To condense the trees. So when the forecast for mist was there, um, I asked my wife Laura, would she mind making up? Because um, I would give her the the call because obviously the morning she knows she wasn't in a great place, but she she must have wanted me out of the house. So she <laughs> said, go on ahead and, and go on up before work. Um, so I headed on up the road for an hour up the road and got to the location. And I was shooting, and I think there was another photographer or two there, typical of the dark edges. Yep. They never stayed about too long. We, we got a couple of images with the fog and they headed on. And the classic shot is shooting in the middle of the road. And it, for me, it's, it's the best shot. That's that's the only shot, you know, I don't like it off to the side. It's not as, it's not as uh, pleasing. Um, yeah, yeah. And two little birds popped up on the side of the road. And I was like, yeah, okay. Some of these locations, so some of these settings here give me for like a number of seconds. If these are flying, I'm not getting anything sharp. So whacked up the ISO and um, just the yeah, stop and all that kind of thing. And got it to sort of one thirtieth, I think of a second. And the birds moved from the right hand side of the road to the left hand side of the road on the bottom of the, on the on the road. And I just stood my ground for another sort of four or five minutes and eventually they just fluttered up into the middle of the road where you see in the image. And I got lucky and I got I got I got it. There's a couple of other shots where the birds, the shape of the birds are like two plastic black bags flying in the wind. So yeah. um, you could probably shoot a hundred of them and 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 get lucky and get one. I shot three and, and I managed to get lucky and get one. So, um, but as soon as I seen the image, I, I thought of Lindsay and Simon, her husband, and I come up with the uh, the title "Souls Tied" straight away. Um, yeah. Yeah. So I thought I seen it in the back of the camera. And I was like, Fuck, zoom in here and check that the birds are adequately sharp and right enough. Like there's 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 blurring of the wings, but I like that it, it added to the sort of mood. Yeah, I think I think that blurring add, adds you know to the you know dynam dynamism of the image, if anything. Yeah, I thought it made it sort of look at maybe it's spookier sort of stereo looking. So um but but the heads of the birds were sharp and, and that's that's what I wanted. So I was driving back down the road to log on to the computer for work before we went to the funeral. And um, I phoned the wife and my wife was like, you're not going to believe this. The shot I've got this morning, I said, I think it could be a really special shot. And I explained to her what had happened. And she said, she's that's like Lindsay and Simon. So she was thinking along the same lines as me. So I think I was probably meant to go there that morning. And I think the, the shot was meant for me. You know, it's just a lucky shot. So... Yeah, no, it's uh, got to say, it's a, it's a brilliant shot. Um, I guess, obviously, you know, the, the, the birds themselves are opportunistic. Do you often go into the field with the concept of what it is that you're looking for? Or do you tend to go and react to what's going on in the landscape when, when you get in, into the field? So I guess, how much do you put down to planning? How much do you put down to, you know, opportunism? Not just for yeah, that shot, but in general. Yeah, yeah. Um, no, I would I would plan quite a lot. I would use apps for weather and tide. I like I like seascape photography with long exposure. Mm -hmm. It's nice to have a bit of movement in the water or or at times make it go like glass. So I would plan tide times, weather apps and all sorts of for instance, I'm going to a location in Donegal tomorrow evening after work, which mm -hmm. is three hour drive away with two photography friends. And um I'm planning for that there. So it's this time of year where the nights are slightly longer and um, that you're getting the, the sunset at the right time. It's a it's a place called Hornhead um, and it's just a massive uh, sea arch and it's just, it's stunning. Um, you, you you follow me on Twitter, so I'll stick a, a video up tomorrow when I'm, I'm up, you, you maybe see it tomorrow morning. Um, yeah, it's an absolute, it's, like, it's very Jurassic looking, so it is, it's amazing. I've been six times last year and never managed to get the image I wanted. Mm. Um, so I'm um, hoping it happens tomorrow. I was up again there last week and um, yeah, never got the image as well, but I'll, I'll keep going back to get it. Often I plan, um, but rarely, again, you know, yourself when you're shooting uh, landscape stuff, you can plan all you want, but sometimes the element have, elements have a different idea. So again, you know, it's about reacting to that.
Yeah, I think, uh, you know, sometimes that, as you said, you know, with you, um, you award-winning shot, uh, you know, it's, you, you've got to react to what's going on. But, um, you know, sometimes I think the planning that you put in being there at the right time with the right conditions is uh, one of the one of the key things. Is that something that uh, I guess you've you know taken on board as advice from from others, or is that something that you've just sort of stumbled into? Yeah, well, I think when you're doing, I sort of started probably taking photographs in 2010, so it doesn't. It seems like yesterday, but it seems like years ago, and so it's 12 years. After a while, you sort of you sort of develop that skill a wee bit, you know. But I mean, all of you know, all of the planning in the world and the reacting. Sometimes the conditions don't just give you what you want, and you're having to go locations a number of times, like the Hornhead tomorrow night. Yeah, fingers crossed it works. But um, yeah, sometimes all the reacting in the in the world, I I would be very very hard to please. Um, and I would be on my own harshest critic, you know. I would always sort of being super critical of my own work. There's there's not a lot of my work that I genuinely love. Like I hear people coming on podcasts all the time and yep. the the love of uh, quite a lot of what they shoot. Um I don't know. It's I don't know what it is with me. I'd be very self-critical and um never really satisfied. There's probably only a few images in my portfolio that I sit back and go, yeah, that's that's good. Yeah. You know, but there's yeah, it's one of those ones, you know. That's maybe a personality thing. Yeah, no, that's that, that's that's great. What a what about um you your favourite spots? I mean, obviously Hornhead, as you said, is uh, you know a, a biggie for you that you you're still chasing. Are there any others that you sort of find yourself drawn back to just because they're you know I mean they might be iconic or not. Um, but are there any favourite spots that you've got that uh, you know you you just have to go to? You keep getting called back to. Um, in Ireland, yeah, there's there's always like there's Donegal's full of um, mm -hmm. this is um, there's Mullen Head and and Donegal, it's Ireland's most northerly point. It's and uh, there's a classic shot there of an image there from a few years ago that um, I have in my portfolio, and I was there again another the other week as well um trying to better that but again it's it's the right time of the year when they, then when the, the evenings are long and the sun's setting in the right spot to get the side light and stuff um and you've maybe a, a a number of weeks to get it but having a newborn child you know you can't just get up and go three hours away as as, as often as i would, would have done maybe two months ago before he was born but um Connemara and Donegal, or Connemara and, and uh, Andy Galway, stunning as well. If you've seen images of there, a few of there as well. Mm -hmm. um, the north coast of Ireland, um, stunning as well. Um, there's like Dunley's Castle, there's Giant's Causeway, Valley Castle, um, Mossad and Temple, Downhill Beach. Yeah, there's, there's loads all over Ireland. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Now, I think, um, you know, you certainly live in a uh, beautiful part of the world. I um, did a visit over there a few years ago, pre-COVID. Um, unfortunately, I, I was based mainly down in the, the south of Ireland. So, you know, lot, lots of shots of the Ring of Kerry. We did a day trip up into Northern Ireland, um, went to the Giants Causeway and Carricka Reed and that sort of thing. And it was... Probably yeah. the foggiest foggiest day for for months. So, um, got to the Giants Causeway, you couldn't see um, more than about three or four feet in front of you. So, it was kind of, as a Not photography great. trip, well, it wasn't so great. So you, so you couldn't see all of the tourists then. <laughs> well, you could you, you could hear them around you, and you could yeah. sort of see these dim shapes moving around in the in the fog but sounds like a horror trip, huh? you, could, you couldn't see um, the sea you couldn't see the, the, the jams causeway the jams causeway is a funny one because it's a sunset shot you know it, there's no doubt about it but um the amount of tourists there all over the stones and stuff and if you're, you're taking an image is it's off putting so i uh, think on the winter months i will go back up this month and maybe try and get a moody image um at sunrise whenever there's nobody but you know just something a little bit different. It's quite hard to compose an image in the in the Giants Causeway. It's it's almost like when you're in the forest and you can't see the way through the trees. It's just very, very hard to find a decent composition. You you find a lot of landscape photographers 
use three or four set compositions of the jazz cause when I'm not yeah. doing see too much else, you know. Yeah. Um you were you were saying you were in Kerry. I don't know how I forgot about Kerry. Kerry is absolutely stunning and dangling down that way, you know, it's, it's beautiful. Yeah, absolutely. But had had some really nice conditions down there. Um, you know, uh, there, there was a little bit of fog, but it was mostly down in some of the valleys, uh, as opposed to being everywhere and all over my shot, which was, you know, uh, <laughs> a little little annoying for uh, you know that. Unfortunately, as I said, it was just a one day deal, so I couldn't uh, couldn't sort of get back up there. Uh, unfortunately, but uh, yeah, I if you're ever back there. in Ireland, if you're ever back in Ireland, give me a shout and we'll meet up for a shoot, definitely. Absolutely, that that sounds great. Thank you. Um, I guess obviously that influences uh, what you shoot. Does it? Do you find that you know, living where you do, does that influence how you shoot as well? So, is it mostly seascapes and the the coastline, or mountains, or you know, I guess what you know, what is it that I guess uh, you find that where you live influences how you shoot? Uh, that's a good one. Um, that's a hard one to answer. Um, when I when I first took up the backup photography in 2010 and joined the camera club, the consensus of the camera club was like, well, you got to shoot everything because we want to compete against other camera clubs. But when I joined the camera club, I really just wanted to shoot landscape. Yeah. I was I was kind of uh, intrigued by long exposure. It's, it was banned photography magazines and soaking up everything that was in the articles there and the tips there as well as it was in the camera club and. At the time, I was seeing a lot of long exposures. I was like, oh, I want to try that. I want to get filters. I'll get lead filters and I'll, I'll create my own ones kind of thing of locations close to me, you know, that are, mm -hmm. I suppose, iconic for somebody around here, or, you know. But, um, yeah. That's okay. How much of you, how much of your success would you attribute to your ability to communicate well? That was a tough question, wasn't it? <laughs> um, I don't know. I, I don't know, honestly. Um, I don't know that I've had really that much success either. Um, I just like making images. Um, I just like, I don't like the standard landscape image. I like to put mood and feeling into an image. So I suppose in terms of my, my work and stuff and communicating, I don't like bright and breezy and, you know, those sort of Simpsons, blue sky, white clouds kind of thing. I would much rather have changeable mood conditions. So um, I suppose if you want to sort of link that to my work and mm -hmm. I don't know if it's my personality or either, because um, I'm pretty happy for my life and stuff. So, um, yeah, it's, I, I don't know. I, I can't answer that. No, that's fine. That's fine. I'm um, terrible. <laughs> <laughs> No, it's, it's all good, mate. Um, I guess, how are you finding now with uh, your, your, your new baby uh, balancing, you know, lifestyle with your photography? You know, are you a full-time photographer or are you doing it on the side? No, I have a full-time job. I'm still working an office job, nine to five, Monday to Friday kind of thing. Um Two days in the office, three in the house because of COVID still. But um, I also have a weekend job as well. Um, oh, wow. So yeah, the, which is twelve-hour shifts. So there's not a lot of free time. Um, that was all before the baby, and now of course our baby Levi is born as well. So there's even less time, um, and you've that constant. You have children, can't you? Yeah. Oh, well, oh, they're, yeah. they're all adults now. Three, three girls. They're. Uh... I think the oldest. Lucky you, you. Lucky you. You can get out and photograph them. Yeah, well, I can so now. You know, yeah. you know you've got that. You know you've got that constant state of just. I've, like, al I've also packed in full time work, so uh, I can. Uh, I, I got plenty of time to go out and shoot whenever well, I want. Keep rubbing it in, sure. Yeah, keep rubbing it in. Um, <laughs> yeah, so you, you know that sort of constant, like six out of ten tiredness kind of thing, where yeah. you. But Levi's eight weeks old and on Saturday coming, and I think I've been out. One, two, three, three. Tomorrow will be my fourth time um, yeah. night shooting, but only 
this will be my third with three of the four times I've been out at sort of proper locations, you know, one was just a local location. So um, I'm finding it's it's severely limited, but we have a week, we have a week booked in Connemara for the end of September. So I'll, I'll, we have the, the in-laws coming down. It was a mm-hmm. tactical invite so that they could do a bit of babysitting and we could, me and my wife could maybe go to the pub some night and I'll be up for sunrise and be doing sunset every day we're away, you know, so <laughs> with an extra two pair of hands to sort of look after Levi while I can indulge in a bit of photography to keep me... Uh, to, keep take me. advantage of it, mate. It makes all the difference having that extra set of hands around. Yeah, big time. Yeah. So, yeah, I'm looking forward to Colin Mara and I, I would hope to sort of try and nail a few shots, you know, in the bag that, that I'm personally sort of pleased with before then. So, right. yeah. It's, t- it's tough not getting out as much, I won't lie. You know, it's, especially if it's your passion. Like, it's not my... It's not my job it's it's not i don't call it a hobby i call it a passion because if i'm not making new images i'm kind of bored of sharing old images repeatedly on facebook yep. and instagram and twitter and all that you know just i'd rather be out making images and um it's the same as making images like i'd rather be out in field on location traveling to location that sort of buzz that excitement the thrill of the chase than i would be sitting at a computer uh, processing an image as well yeah yeah so to, talk to me a little, little bit about that, I guess, you know, um, we'll start off with how you, how you work in the field. What are you, what are you looking for when you get into the fields? I mean, you know, assuming it's, you know, somewhere that you've not been before and you, you're trying to scout an image, what, what sort of things are you, you know, driving for and, and, and looking for to, to incorporate into, uh, into a shot? Um. I'll be honest, I don't mind if it's like a, a classic, um, they call them honeypot. I, I, it doesn't bother me to have a honeypot sort of location and a honeypot shot like Malin Head. Yep. Um, because I know if it's an image that pleases me at the end of the day, it's it's quality. Because um, again, I'll come back to it being so hard to please. Um, I've scoured location, look on social media. Um, not just other photographers stuff, but, you know, standard sort of iPhone snaps from random people, because sometimes you'll see an iPhone snap from a random person of a random location. I think I, I could, there's, there's a shot there somewhere, so you can go and you can sort of scope it out and yeah. take a few visits, but, you know, you could get an image out of it, you know. Sometimes images that are unplanned, sometimes images that are unplanned, um, a sort of local locations are the most rewarding because it's just it's just been gifted to you you know it's not like a dark edges or it's not like a giant's causeway yeah, yeah. nothing big it's just a nice little shot of a, a woodland scene or something or something like a, a minimalist seascape and sometimes that can turn you on as much as a honeypot you know yeah absolutely yeah so what what about uh when you you know you you get into the field itself for you, you know, dropping the tripod where you think you should and getting snapping or are you hunting around a little bit longer before you uh, get into, into shooting and taking your time about it? Sometimes you get to a location and there's like quite limited sort of images of what you can take and sometimes there's a, there's a good handful. So yeah. I'll stick the tripod down on the floor and the camera back down and I'll just I'll have a wander about and stuff and then I'll do a second sort of wander about with the camera in my hand sort of checking out different focal lengths and stuff and, and trying to work the, the foreground and stuff and, and obviously mm-hmm. the, the background to complete the image but um, I'll do that there and then I'll sort of probably settle on a shot and you'll be taking a few images and then you think oh. and then you're looking in the back of the camera and you're zooming in and it's like no there's something here that I'm not quite happy with so yeah, you might be slightly out of balance or whatever yep yeah, or just sometimes it's just like one little rock or something that annoys me, and now that's it. Like you know, it's like it's like if you're shooting a long exposure and the, the clouds are streaking. But I like I like the clouds, and I don't like any like parts of any of the corners of the image. I like the if it's a heavy sort of moody sky. It, it has to be yeah, sort yeah. of down over the whole. It has to be sort of bringing it down in, you know. So we tiny things will annoy me and stuff. Um, and I'm not I'm not sort of clone sort of things out or anything or add things in and. Okay. Production is sort of as in camera, so that's the way it would work. Cool. So I'll, I'll ask you a little bit about the processing. Do you, you know, you're straight in, pardon me, I'll ask you a bit about the processing. You're straight into it and 
uh, you know, editing as soon as you, you you get them home, or are you taking your time about it and you know, leaving it? I mean, some photographers I've spoken to won't look at an image for months before they uh, they start editing, and even then, it might you know be several edits over a period. Are you one of those sorts of photographers, or are you one that gets into it, gets it done, and you know leaves it? Yeah. So the, the end thing to say on Instagram is stick it up in your story and say, let it marinate. And yeah. then people will let it marinate for all of two days and then uh, post it on Instagram. Um, <laughs> it depends on the very, very rarely would I edit straight away. Um, going back to what I said earlier on, I much prefer to be out in the field shooting. Um, that's where I get real enjoyment, you know. Post-processing, I'm working, I would post-process on a, a MacBook Pro, which is, I think, nine years old. So it sounds like a, an airplane at the moment, and I'm on my wife's uh, work computer doing the Zoom because there's something wrong with the sound in mine. It, it runs really slow. I think to do a 20-minute edit on my MacBook Pro at the moment. You're talking, it could take two to three hours. So wow. <laughs> I jump straight into post-processing, but I never, I never really have. Not I did sort of in the earlier days, you know, when I was sort of first starting out the first couple of years, but... In, re, in the last sort of five, sort of six, seven years, I've, I've sort of let them sit any time between sort of a couple of weeks and a couple of months. I was out, yeah. I was out in February with a good friend, Michael, shooting the snow up in the Belfast Hills. Um, and I think I got a, a, a decent little shot there, but they loaded onto the computer and then they're moved off the computer to create space on the external hard drive, but I haven't even looked at them yet, you know. Wow, okay. I'll maybe, I'll maybe leave it to November or something when people are sick of snowy shots. <laughs> yeah, but, stick, uh, stick up the yeah. autumn shots in spring. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah well, my stuff's all over the place. So. <laughs> I'm a bit like that. I mean, I, I, I don't think there's anything better than running through your, your old shots, particularly some of the ones that when you initially looked at them, you thought, oh, yeah, well, it's a secondary shot. I'll get I'll get back to that maybe, you know. But coming back to it, you know, months later or even years later in some cases and going, yeah, I'll take another look at that and, you know, coming up and going, yeah, well, that's actually better than the one I thought was, you know, the the, the top shot. Yeah. <laughs> We, we were when we were in New York in 2018. I think it was February 18. Or was it 17? I think it was 18. And um, I was in the Guggenheim. We went to the Guggenheim because I'd wanted to go in and shoot a wee bit of architecture, high key stuff. Mm -hmm. And of course, we went and it was closed because of a bank holiday or something. So we went into the gift shop and looking up straight away, I could see I could see an image. And I, I asked the guy, it was just us in the gift shop. And I asked the guy, can I, can I lay on the ground and get my tripod out? And he's like, yeah, work away, go on ahead. So I shot that image and I never did anything with it. And I was sitting bored one night a couple of years later during lockdown. I think it was mid-2020. And I was like, let's read, let's read old shots to see if there's anything I can yep. polish up, you know, edit. And got a good image out of it. Like, it's a nice high key sort of architecture thing. So sometimes a bit of a pair of fresh eyes is good. Yeah, definitely, definitely. I think sometimes letting it, you know, sit and gestate uh, for a while actually helps because it clears your, clears your head from the experience that you had because, you know, I, I normally come home and if, if I know I've got a, a really, you know, banging shot, I'm, I'm quite excited to get into it and, and edit it. But sometimes, you know, kicking back and just leaving it for a while, um, I, I find it helps me sort of clear my head of the excitement and then, you know, you get back into you know, a, a more, I guess, hard-nosed edit around, okay, what's good, what's bad, what do I need to crop out, what do I need to, you know, it, you know keep in, you know, what, what am I, you know, what am I doing with those tones and the, the, the contrast and so forth, you know, do, do yeah, I, I agree. do I do my, I sorry? I think, the time of day. I think the time of day when you're editing as well, I like to sort of edit sort of, not on bright sunny days, obviously you have the blinds closed and stuff, but um, when you're processing, but um, I think it's sort of, again, like sort of maybe in an even sort of, well, I was going to say this kind of like, but it's sort of getting dark now, you know, sort of that would be the kind of time, you know, we can just sit and sort of and, and relax in there. It's sort of, I think when things are too bright, it sort of affects it. I've, I've done that before and I've edited and that means when it's been too bright and then all of a sudden I've, I've looked at it sort of in an even sort of in a, in a duller room. Like, yeah. You know, that off. Yeah. No, I know. I know exactly what you mean. It's uh, it, it's amazing how much difference you know, just, as you say, just the lighting in the room can can make to you know, not just your mood, but also how you you know how, how you sort of 
bring the edit around, you know. And for me, it, it, it's really that, you know, take your time, look at it a few times. I mean, there's, I mean, there's plenty of stuff that I put on the Instagram, which are just, you know, quick edits. They, you know, I shot this yesterday or today or whatever, and you know, I want, I'm, I'm excited to share it, but you know, I know it's not my best work, but that's yeah. not necessarily. Uh, I'm not, I'm not one of those sort of portfolio. Um, uh, what do you call it, curated, uh, you know, photographers where, you know, they're only putting their portfolio shots up. I, I will put up pretty much anything that I think is worth a look, whether it gets lots of likes or not, I don't really care. It's more, you know, here's, here's my stuff, here's what I'm working on. You know, sometimes it'll just be a work in progress and I'll go, you know, this this is, you know, what what I want to show you today, you know. I think with the likes and social media, it's like it's it's all sort of who cares because it's throwaway. You know, you'd be scrolling through Instagram. You know yourself. You, yep. You could if somebody. It means more to me if somebody stops and actually makes a see all these sort of like awesome or stunning. That you know, or a, a, just a comment that's an emoji. Like it doesn't really mean anything. You know, um, I think if somebody's putting on a thoughtful comment mm. or something that actually show, showing that they've actually looked at the image means an awful lot more than say 500 or a thousand likes or whatever you know because it's, it's all it's all it's so fast track to social media you know will anybody really remember my shot that they've seen two minutes earlier probably not you know yeah. uh, for the most for the most part like you know i'm i'm sort of honest about it because that's, that's not just me like most photographers you know as well i, I think yeah, it's just the way it is. It moves so fast, especially on Twitter. Like you think, and you would miss loads oh, on Twitter. You know, absolutely. Yeah, <laughs> and the it's algorithms good. aren't helping uh, helping anyone either, because you know, you. I mean, particularly on Instagram, I don't know what your standard feeds like. I've I've started using the following feed um, almost exclusively on Instagram, simply because that. Gives... I, I I didn't even know about that. I sort of. Yeah, so you, you you tap on the Instagram logo at the top, and then it says following underneath, and tap that, and that actually gives you a more chronological feed. Um, All right, okay. Whereas like, if, kind of like it used to be. Yeah, it's more like what it used to be. It's, it's not a hundred percent, but it's it's better than better than the standard feed because the standard feed I find is full of reels and ads, and I rarely see photographers that I follow. So if you if you do what you've said there, do you get less sort of adverts? I wouldn't say you get less ads, but. <laughs> it's terrible, but I've never like. You, you tend to see more, algorithm. yeah. You tend to see more of who you follow as opposed to you know all of the reels and whatever. Unless you know who you follow is just posting reels, obviously. But you know. I've, I've never understood algorithm in any sort of social media. Um, I kind of that's I had a Facebook page that has sort of I don't know what it has, something like seven thousand followers, and you mm. post an image and anything from I think it was in around about two thousand fourteen. Um, anything after 2000, the end of 2014, when you post an image, um, it was maybe getting 16 likes. And I don't know how it's getting 16 likes if you've X amount of followers, which yeah. isn't a grand amount of followers, but like you, you should get it, just means nobody's seeing it. So at, at that point, Facebook were looking you to pay the money to promote your work to people that have actually liked your page. So I, I, I sort of gave up on Facebook totally and yeah. went over to Instagram. I had an Instagram and gave it up like a personal one just snaps of family stuff you know and then i i went back into it um, 2000 maybe 13 14 mm -hmm. and it's sort of i see a lot of it instagram getting a lot of negative press but it's going a bit like TikTok and videos and all that kind of crap so yeah yeah um i've had a twitter for years and years and i've only started using it sort of daily since january so yeah no, I, I started, uh, would have been about 2010, I think, on Twitter. And um, uh, photography wasn't a thing on Twitter back then, so uh, did, didn't see a lot. You know, follow, followed comedians and news and that sort of thing and very rarely posted. It was mostly just me, you know, consuming stuff. Uh, yeah. Very rarely. I like news and stuff. Yeah. I, I might make a comment here and there, but very, very rarely. But, um, you know, when photography Twitter sort of blew up uh, a year or so ago, 
um, you know, obviously started to find and follow a lot more photographers. And, um, you know, yeah, I mean, it's one of the reasons why I found you is because I followed somebody that, you know, was also in the, the, the competition that you won and then saw your okay. name pop up as the winner and thought, oh, better, better have a look at his stuff because he's winning stuff. So. <laughs> Oh, uh, I did. won songs and winning stuff. So that sort of, I don't count Camera Club as winning stuff, you know. It's yeah, fair enough. Yeah, it's just, <laughs> I think, like, I, I'm very honest, like, you know, the, the shot's a special shot and it's a stunning shot. But when I shot it, I didn't, I didn't phone the wife and say, Hey, but I'm absolute cracker here. Yeah. And that was the actual closing date of UK Landscape Photographer of the Year, which I would enter every year and yep. always get rejected. And very rarely shortlisted for it. I have had one image in it um, back in 2016. And when I first took up photography, it wasn't so much the camera club and the advanced members that were inspiring me. It was like landscape photographers in England, you know, mm-hmm. that were shooting like I'm down here and they're way up here. And I, that's yeah, what yeah. inspired to sort of achieve, you know, and get to that level. Like, not necessarily yeah. shoot the same stuff, but get to that level and um when I got one in 2016 I was over the moon so we went over to London on all part but I've uh, I've entered a few images since shortlisted a few times but never really any further so I've only made the big once I'm shortlisted again this year with two images one that's been popular this year but I can't name what image it is it mightn't get into the book if it's won something else so um yeah um don't know where I was going with that. <laughs> it's okay, no problem. <laughs> I, was getting, I was going off on a tangent there, I do that, and then I was like, what was the question? Why was I even talking? Why did he invite me on? Rather than this bit, I'd take it. No. <laughs> <laughs> um, what's, what's your most memorable experience when uh, out shooting? Can I name can I name a couple? Yeah, sure. What whatever. Um, um, you know, it, so it, even better if you've got a horror story. <laughs> I have a I have a couple of horror stories. Go for it. Um do you want to go with the horror stories because nobody wants to hear hear a happy story. Uh, well <laughs> I'll give you a slight happy story and then a horror story two days later. So I'm That's 42. Good. In February 2020, I became 40 and my wife knew the photon was uh, my dream location to shoot and you know you're shooting from the hamlet bridge and you're getting the red huts in the mountain in the background the classic image but there's all sorts of images and it's like between from belfast to the north coast away they're all within sort of an hour of each other these absolutely stunning stunning images mm. and quite often you're getting great conditions and there was a little red hut uh, an image um and it's a little red hut fishing hut in ramberg uh, just outside hamnoy and this in the Fulton Island um, and we booked the trip and that was one of my main images it wasn't the classic sort of funny pot image but all photographers take this too and I had it in my head you know again shooting landscape photography how often do you have a picture in your head often I have a picture in my head of what I want to visualize and what I want to create yep. and nine times more than nine times out of ten it doesn't happen because I can't control the weather I had a superpower that would be what I want to control the weather. That's exactly how I want it. <laughs> and uh, so we blizzard one day. We we're on the second sort of day in the Fulton uh, of a ten day trip. It cost about five thousand pounds to get there and stuff. You know, you have two flights and you have a ferry and stuff over to the Fulton Islands. So we drive from Hamnoy down to Ramberg to shoot this little red hut because I wanted totally isolated. I didn't want to see this the background mountains and stuff. I just wanted the there to be snow in the bottom of the image, the red hut, and then just nothing, just just totally minimalist. And I said to my wife, Laura, I was like, right, this blizzard here, let's get down to Hamburg. It's only half an hour away. I can get this image if the snow keeps up. So we get down to Ham now. And it was the most, uh, just in terms of shooting, I've been shooting for 12 years, but in terms of shooting, it was the happiest it's been. Mm. Um, my wife and I is there with the umbrella over because I've got the filter over the lens and stuff I'm taking images and I know I've got a great image by the 30th of a second you get little wisps of snow and stuff and sort of a grey sky but you're, it's just minimalist you know you're not seeing anything behind the red hot it's beautiful get the image and stuff and 
again then to another couple of days into the holiday so it's like the third or fourth day into the holiday uh, sunrise and um we go to i think i'm going to butcher the pronunciation of this i think it's called Udeflev beach no. and it's well it's hard to spell i'll let you know how to spell i'll send you a message <laughs> how to spell and just you should see some of the images from from it it's absolutely stunning i never got what i wanted um but we're shooting uh it was a sunday morning i remember it so clearly shooting and shooting and the, the best light's gone because I'm shooting an hour after sunrise and thinking I know I'm not you know those times and you're not going to get anything but yep. you're in a stunning location you've paid loads of money to get there I'll keep shooting because that's what I'm here to do and you just never know your luck something yeah. sometimes something happens something did happen um so I'm shooting at the rocks and there's waves coming up but not not too far and I'm shooting there for about half an hour different exposures sort of one second, two seconds, I'm sort of adjusting the settings to get the different flow of the water. And a wave came in and knocked me off my feet, knocked my tripod off my feet, yeah. cars attached. Yeah. Um, I went down and I swear I was only down for like two seconds, three seconds at the most, got back up on the tripod. The camera was soaked, uh, Nordic salt water. Did it, did it survive? Water. Nordic salt water, the best water to ever in a cannon. 5D Mark IV. Um, tripod come up with two legs, and you do photography, so you know the tripod's with three legs. So the tripod was gone. The filter holder, I don't know how, was got attached from the end of the, the lens with two leaf filters attached. So that was about 300 quid worth gone. Mm -hmm. And you know that attitude, that's fine, that not happened to me. I, I got up to the car. My wife thought something well something bad had happened but my wife thought somebody had died like i was i was wearing a pair of waders as well so i was my eyes were water was coming out of my eyes and i was in convulsions as i couldn't move and, and that the water was that cold i don't know if it, whether it was a shock or whatnot but i could physically couldn't move my hand she took the camera off me and dumped it in the back of the car I was like we need to get back to the hotel i need to get this new radiator uh, um did all that put it in rice blah 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 camera never worked again and yeah, so the camera never worked again. I lost the tripod, I lost two filters, lost this. I think it was using 70, 17 to 40 lens. I think in all, nothing was insured. Uh, in all, I lost about 4,500 pounds worth of um, uh, camera gear and stuck up on social media again, you know, thinking the camera will be grand. You know, I'd never had an experience like this before. The camera will be grand, it will work so well. I was sort of convinced, you know, that attitude will not happen to me. Yeah. Would anybody have any leaf filters or do you know where I can buy leaf filters in the photon? And there was a there was a guy running a workshop from I think he was from Derry in Ireland. Mm -hmm. Um he's running a workshop and he followed me and he, he said, Listen, I'm running a workshop here. There's a guy we're two hours away from where you're staying. He can lend you filters, he can lend you a tripod and the filter holder. I was like, happy days. Um, give us your address, we'll come down tonight because he was going the next day. Yeah, amazing. So we drove down, and the, the guy says, I don't think your camera's going to work again. Can you buy another camera? And I, I said, No, I can't buy another camera. We'll spend a lot of money to come here. Um, I haven't won the lotto, you know. So yep. he says, Is there anybody that could lend you a camera? Because of another guy coming out in a couple of days' time. So I was like, Well, my dad's got a 5D Mark II. So long story short, um, Another guy coming out on this this fella from Daddy's workshop um brought my dad's camera out. So I was able to use a mixture of my dad's camera and the other some of my gear that survived and and another guy, Andy Coulter's um gear that he lent me. So it was, it was a stock up, but I couldn't relax after I, I, I couldn't make any images that I wanted to. The only thing that survived was um uh the the, the, the images from the first couple of days and I was so so glad because if I could pick one thing to survive in hindsight, it would be... Yeah, you want the memory card yeah. to survive, yeah. Yeah, because it, it, I've, I've got, I think I've got probably my, 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 my personally favourite image that I've ever shot. I call it Surviving the Elements. And it's one of those images where it was a blizzard. So I, I actually titled the image Surviving the Elements when I was shooting, not because mm. of what happened a couple of days later, but then <laughs> again, it, it, it had a, it fit, it had a deeper meaning, you know? Yeah, so, so from... from Hero to zero in like two days. It was yeah, it was crazy. So I have unfinished business with the photon. Um and I want to get out there to shoot again. So um mm, definitely if anybody's listening to the anybody's listening to the podcast and wants to send me some money, um I'm, I'm willing <laughs> to take another clip there. Yeah. <laughs>
No, it's, it's on the list. If they're sending money, I'll 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 let it filter through my account first. <laughs> oh yeah, go go through your insurance and ask for the small cut. <laughs> no, but you know then it's uh the photon is just so beautiful. Like it's everywhere you turn there's it's it's there's it's just beauty, yeah. you know. It's it's, it's, it's one of those one of those iconic yeah. places that it doesn't matter yeah. which way you face, you the, there's a there's a shot. Yeah. I'll send, I'll send you that image, Surviving the Elements. Yeah, and, perfect. You know, yeah. Use for this, but um, it's definitely one of my favourites. Um, so, so pleased that it, it survived. And that was, I knew the camera was dead after a couple of days, and I was just waiting on my dad's camera coming to try the memory card. And um, when I knew that, when I knew that the images were safe, yeah, I was, I was, I was happy. Like, yeah, no, that's incredible. What have you learned about the world through photography? Salt water is bad for cameras. It's <laughs> the first thing, you know. <laughs> uh, what have I learned about the world of photography? Um, well, that experience there, like, you know, social media can be a positive place because, I mean, without social media, I wouldn't have my dad's camera. Yeah, that I would never have, have happened. Have yeah. that stuff. But it can also be a, a negative place as well. You know, I've had people send me abusive messages on social media. Um, so, uh What have I learned about the world of photography? I don't know. Like so from 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 the start of taking landscape photographs, I, I don't know that it answers the question, but I take a lot more in in terms of when I'm out on location. I'll just be I'll just find myself someday sitting in work looking out the office and going, Jesus, look how quick those clouds are moving. That would be a, a great long exposure. Yep. You're taking you you take more interest in the little things, mm. which are really the big things like the landscape and looking after it and stuff. Um, you take more interest in that there whereas before landscape photography I would never have thought of stuff like that you know yeah um, you wouldn't notice it yeah yeah no I wouldn't have a clue yeah. if, if um, you've any way of leading me on to some of the tangent to answer that question better you know I can do that you can edit this out that's fine <laughs> yeah, yeah you're really, you're gonna have like a 30 minute podcast here of no, me no, no. Of it's accident. all good it's all good most of this will go in <laughs> <laughs> yes. I'm not going to listen to this back. <laughs> Sorry, right, I don't ever do that. And then I, the I, well, which is going to be bad. I, once I finish the uh, the overall edit, I, I never listen to them again. <laughs> that, that's probably a good thing in this case. Yeah, I, you've had I, some, mate, you've had some like you've had some great like Rachel Stewart, isn't it? Yeah, Rachel. Rachel was on uh, a, a few weeks ago. Um, had um, Alice there, Ben. Um, he, yeah. Alistair Ben, love his work. Yeah, I've had had quite a few. Uh, you know, I've, I've been fortunate enough to connect with uh, quite a few people, and um, you know, for for me, I mean, this this started as a, a COVID project. Um, I we, we were in lockdown for 165 days. Uh, couldn't go more than five kilometres away, and where I live is suburban Sydney, and. I'm not a suburban photographer. I know I know there's people out there that do that sort of urban banal, you know, yeah, shot, shots of telegraph poles or you know, um, uh, you know, a tree. It's a, telegraph a, pole. it's a telegraph pole. It doesn't interest me either. I have to say, I was, I was looking through your work whenever you asked me to do this, um, and your I think there's an NFT for sale on Foundation. The one of Sydney Harbour is absolutely stunning. Oh, but, thanks. But see the. See, I like how it looks in foundation before you click into it. See that square crop? Mm. I think it's much better. I do, like I, you need to see it bigger, but I, I, if you've looked, uh, you know you've asked me to do this because of that um, competition win. But I would be I would be partial to a square crop, uh, quite like a square crop. I don't know why. And I think the more I take images in square, the more I start to see in square. Yeah. Um, yeah. And so I'm subconsciously looking for square crops, but the, I think that. That is absolutely stunning square crop image. The colours just the colours love it. Eh? That's somewhere yeah. I would love to photograph. Well, thank thanks very much for that. Um, I mean, I I've been. It, it's funny some some stuff I'll leave in a you know the standard three by two, but uh, you know quite a lot of stuff recently I've been sort of looking at different crops and you know I'm sort of being attracted more to that that square one by one to you know just. You know, nail into you know that that focus point in the image, and 
Yeah. Lovely as well when you print an image and you have a nice white border around a natural white border around an image. It's just, Absolutely. It's just yeah. so clean looking, so it is. Well, I've got one, got one on the wall of uh, Glasshouse Rocks, which is uh, about oh, four or five hours south of where I live. And um, stunning sort of sea stacks. One of them's got this sort of lovely curve. It, look, it actually looks a bit like a, a, a massive wave breaking on the on the shore. But I've got, you know, that done in a square crop on, on the wall, as you said, with that white border around. And, yeah. Uh, yeah. How, how far away from you would that be? But that's about four hours, five hours drive from uh, from so my place. You would, be, you would be like me then. You would just no no bar, just get in the car and go. Oh, absolutely. If uh, if I think I can get there, I've actually just recently um, uh, invested in a uh, motorhome, so um, I'm going to be planning to travel around and uh, live in that rather than uh, uh, in, in a house for. Are you, are, you allowed, are you allowed to swear in this podcast? No. You're making me yeah, jealous yeah. again. I don't, I don't care. Yeah. Oh, really? But I was yeah. going to call you a bastard there because you're retired <laughs> or you're, you're not working. Your kids are growing up and I have a motor at home. So you're I'm you're rubbing it in. I'm <laughs> like, uh, maybe get out once this month, uh, the Hornhead. And I'm so excited for tomorrow night to go out and shoot. Like, but if it's anything like last time, I'll be coming back with my table between my legs because I'm disappointed. But I have a good feeling about tomorrow night. But yeah. I would love it. I do have Volkswagen. I'm a Volkswagen kind of guy. I have a 1963 Volkswagen Beetle. Lovely. Um, now, um, now I'm the jealous one. <laughs> no, well, yeah, uh, because of her Beetle love bug, you know, growing up as a child, mm -hmm. born in 1980. So um, it was all because that was an eBay purchase. But I would love, uh, if I won the lotto, I used to say, well, if I won the lotto, I would still get a 1960s Volkswagen Camper, but I would also get a modern one and I would be quitting my job and could just go around shooting I'd be traveling all over England, all over Ireland, Scotland and, and making yeah. images. That, that, that was my original plan. And then, uh, you know, I, I finished up work and it was kind of like, okay, well, now, now's the time. If I'm going to do it, I've got to, got to do it. So, uh, yeah, the, the wife and I are, uh, are off on a trip. We, we take delivery in November. So, um, look, looking oh, forward to to getting out there and getting uh, into some new adventures there, and uh, not having to not having to drive five hours just to get a sunrise, you know. <laughs> yeah, yeah. It's, drive drive the five been, hours, park up, and then walk to walk to the sunrise uh, from the the car park. Uh, there, Levi was born in June, so on, it was April. It was two months before. That was my cutoff point. Like I would sometimes go away and sleep in the car with maybe one other photography buddy, and we would just wind the seats back, sleeping bag, and sleep in the car for a night or two. Um, yeah. to make images, that. maybe that Connemara or something. Um, but I went by myself for the first time ever there back in I think it was April, and um, it was the first time I did it on my own. I felt a bit nervous, you know, sleeping in the car two nights in your own, but normally you have company. But I do 12 hour shifts at the weekend, as I was saying, with a, with a second job, so I'm sort of used to my own company. So, um, although I do like being out in the landscape with friends, I can tomorrow night I go with two friends to the location, mm -hmm. but. It's something quite refreshing about them down in my own to Connemara for two days a meal. And it was yeah. super surprisingly for being in the arsenal of nowhere in Ireland, certain parts you could get decent enough to signal to FaceTime the way so you could you could actually have a conversation with somebody, you know. Yeah, um, yeah. so you weren't totally alone, but it was it was nice. Yeah. And then that's something I plan to do more often, but I'd love to get a camper van. It would have to be Volkswagen because, you know. But um I would love to get a camper van and and the beauty of like just just being able to wake up. I wouldn't be doing. I wouldn't be doing those Instagram shots, though. You know, with you, you open the back doors and you're taking pictures of the back no, of the bed. Yeah, the no, that, that, that turned. That's not yeah. what I would be banned for. No, that that's that's not what that's not what it's for. It's just for sleeping in. They won't. They won't. Yeah, I mean, there there might be the odd shot of the the, the van when I take uh, th take delivery. But beyond that, I don't plan to take many shots of that. I, again, no, years, no, no. years boring. <laughs> yeah, no, definitely. Yeah, no, but yeah, that's that's brilliant, man. I'd love to. There's there's a Volkswagen van. This is kind of in a different podcast, but there's a Volkswagen van for like fifty nine grand or something down close to where we live in the colours. Lovely, and I have seven white cars. Like, could we afford it? Could we afford? What about any sell my car? How much would be a month? But it's still, it's never gonna happen, you know. Uh, no, you never know. Not, you never not, know you like. Yeah, need to win a few more competitions, wouldn't you? Well, that's it. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, get famous. Definitely, definitely. You mentioned no, printing. 
Do you, do you do a lot of printing of your work? Do you print your own or do you use a service? Or? I don't print my own. I use a company in, in Scotland, Glasgow, that, that print it lastly. Um, actually, somebody contacted me that seen an image on Twitter today. And, you know, sometimes as a photographer, you get a comment, is, is a print available of this? And you say, yes, you're sending me a message. And then they reply and say, well, sure, I'll, I'll have what I can say. And then you never hear from them again. But I, it's... The, the lady actually ordered two prints, so two prints are going off to um, I think it's Chicago, Chicago. Mm -hmm. So um, I would get the odd print sale and stuff. I love like there's nothing more. See, the only thing that beats seeing an absolutely what you believe is a cracker image in the back of your camera is seeing the final print on a nice textured fine art paper, absolutely. lovely border around it, and, and and go large. Like I love a large print. Like I've. I've of a couple of, of two large prints in the house of my own stuff. Um, one of Guggenbarra and one of um, the Red Hut in the, in the Fulton. Um, and they're, they're 30 by 30. And then I think uh, something like 36 by 46 or something like that down in the living room. But um, I love, I love a large print and on lovely texture paper. I think that's, I know there's all this thing about selling JPEGs and stuff on Twitter and on nfts and stuff but nothing for me like other than seeing the image in the back of the camera which you truly believe is a stunner is then seeing it eventually printed properly on a beautiful paper it's just it's such a rewarding feeling that's why you do it absolutely yeah i think you know think if, you can, if, if there's one message anyone can get out of uh you know this podcast is you know print your work it's you know i i think it's it, it is the epitome of uh why you do what you do yeah, like, I mean, I, I think I, I get so nervous talking in front of people and stuff and knowing that, well, when people see my name, maybe not many people will listen to this one because they don't know who I am, but um, if anybody gets anything from it, it's like they'll, they'll hear the passion when I, I, I talk about printing and stuff. I, I just love it, you know. Yeah, time. Everybody should, everybody should print the shot that they're proud of, no matter what level they are. Absolutely agree. Have you ever hit a creative wall? Mm, loads, lots, lots. So, what have you done to uh, handle that, and you know, have you have you got yourself out of it in the past? Um, before before Levi came along, my son, um, my motto would be to should, excuse the language. Um, I'm Irish. Should should uh, shoot through the shit. I would always say, like it's like. You know, like you go through a bar and run of you, you go out and you're you're shooting and yep. you're checking conditions and you're just not getting what you're promised and weather ops and tight. Well, you always get what you're promised to test. You're just not getting what you're wanting to lighter for a certain location and stuff. And you go, everybody goes through bar and runs and, uh, you know, just keep shooting through it because if you don't leave the house and you don't take your camera out, you're not going to get an image. There's, you, you have no chance. Um, so I would just try and, and shoot as much as possible. And eventually you'll just get that one and it sort of gets you back on track. And I would be, so I would think I would be a confidence photographer. Like, so I think once I produce one decent image, sort of, I maybe get a couple of, a wee run of decent images over the period of a few months and then I mightn't get anything yeah, uh, okay. for a couple of months. For images yeah. that I truly love, like, as I say, there's, there's, there's a handful of my portfolio that I would truly properly love and think that are right up there. Like we compete against other landscapes that I respect all over the world, but um, they're more rare. Like uh, the ones that I would class as portfolio images, they're they're more rare. You know, maybe if I got maybe four of those a year, I'd be over the moon. Yeah, yeah. They're not, they're not so frequent. Totally, totally with you on that. Uh, I don't think there's anything better than sort of getting that sort of breakthrough image that that might not necessarily be the portfolio image, but it, it's it, it's one that you think, yep, yeah, that's good enough. And then you, you know, you, you, you tend to get a run on after that. It's uh, it's a nice feeling when you, when, when you get there. Yeah, like it's, you know, I've mentioned before about music and music would inspire me um, and taking photographs. Like I would name a lot of my uh, images after song titles or song lyrics, like my wife and I would always be going to gigs and stuff. Um, and yeah, you know, you, you get a band and they release an album and there's maybe three or four singles. It's like, yep. that's my year, you know, there's maybe three or four singles um, or, that are good enough to be 
big portfolio images, and then you get some album tracks, and then you get some B sides that you might work on a couple of couple of years later, kind of thing, you know. Yep, totally, totally. I bet you've never heard anybody use that sort of uh, example before. I, 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 I can it. honestly say that it is a first. So uh, well done. <laughs> <laughs> I've always had that in my head, though. Honestly, I think it's a music thing. I just say we're we're big big music lovers, and yeah. I just, it just links with me. It sits with me, you know. I've always sort of believed that, you know. Not every image you can shoot is portfolio image, and yeah. you need to sort of get over that. I used to get sort of like when you go out on field and, and you come back, you know, when you first start out and you're like, well, did you get any good images today? Oh, yeah, maybe got like two or three. If I got two or three images in the space of six months that I was happy with now, I'd be, I'd be over the moon, you know. So it changes, you know. Um, not everything can be. Personally satisfying, I suppose. No, absolutely, absolutely. Have you ever put together, I guess, that uh, the the album, uh, you know, whether it's the greatest hits or whether it's, uh, you know, a, a mix of A and B sides? Have you ever ever put together uh, or gone out to shoot in that way so that you're sort of putting together a a cohesive project, I guess, as opposed to, you know, okay, well, here's here's a shot from, you know. Uh, you know, location X, and here's a shot from location Y. Have, have you ever done anything like that in your in your career? Like little projects. Yeah. Um, a couple of like um, I have, you know that um, 500 px. Mm -hmm. I shot an image down in Galway in 2016. It was another overnighter in the car um, yep. with my wife and our little dog at the time, Lola, and I've got a nice image. It was a 26 minute exposure of. Um, mm -hmm. Of a diving platform in Galway, obviously at the water. Um, and I got what I thought was lovely image, square image and stuff. And I had it in the living room for a couple of years before I sold it. And um loved the image. And after I made that image, I thought, well, I know everybody again and 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 Twitter's talk about collections and stuff. I'm sure you maybe talk about that later on, but um I thought it would be a nice collection of images, square seascapes. Now yep. I've never done anything with it other than have it on my 500 px as, as a as a folder square seascapes um and just started working on that there um but a more i suppose a more fixed um project would be a work in um social housing that would be my full-time job so at the weekends i'm i'm i would be like a relief concierge in a high-rise blocks of multi-story social housing yep. um tenants so it'll be sort of 12 floors um be talking about 40 tenants in each Mm -hmm. And from about 2013 to 2016, I had a project. It was started off as a one-off uh, portrait with one of the tenants. And um, I called the stories, as in spelled like multi stories, but stories from the high rise, because each yep, image yep. told the story of uh, different tenants, sort of like, I don't attach story to each image. Um, but I think any viewer could sort of see that there's a story behind each image and maybe come up with their own. It was all, all mono, and I don't shoot an awful lot of mono work. Um, yep. But it was all black and white, and yeah, it's it's on the website actually. There's there, well, there's about half of it's on the website. I don't have a lot of portraiture on the website now, but um, I would look at that there. That's that's good. It's, some of the tenants now have passed on and stuff, so it's there's yeah. sort of they could be shot now, they could be shot twenty years ago. You just you wouldn't know, you know. Yeah, yeah. Um, but there's there's quite a lot of sort of feeling and emotion in those. So I don't do an awful lot of set sort of projects. I have to say now. Um, a lot of it would be locations and just me trying to come up with something that I'm, you know, I think fits the location and also sort of suits my style of work. Yeah, sure, sure. Now it's uh, I, I'm I'm fascinated by people that are you know able to go and bring together, as I say, you know that 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 album that's a cohesive piece of work that's multiple images where they've you know concentrated on 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 building that that particular project and uh, yeah. I mean it's something yeah. I've, I've worked on a couple myself and uh, I'm I'm reasonably happy with a, a couple of them but um, you know I, I think it's it's a very difficult thing to to do is to you know bring together as I say something that's cohesive around a, a particular theme or whatever and uh, and you know pull, pull together a number of different images that uh, you know follow that theme. I think the brief is really key, isn't it? You need to have a set brief and you need to sort of know exactly Absolutely. what you want. And otherwise you can veer off and it can go sort of on tangents. It's kind of like yeah. 
Oh, like yeah. and other things get in the way, you know. I'm, yeah, I'm a bit, bit like a squirrel. Oh, look over there. I'm gonna get gonna go. I was gonna say, like, kind of like when you ask me a question and I start answering that question half how you want, and then I go off on a tangent about another story. You know, uh, that, <laughs> you that's what this podcast is all about. It's all about tangents and uh, and you know the divergence yeah. of uh, of thinking about how you do what you do. That's um, you know, I, I guess one of the, one of the things that uh, I, I see as important is, is giving people a, a bit of a platform to, you know, have their say about, um, you know, what what they feel about their photography, uh, or or other things. Yeah. And uh, I'll I'll ask you a couple of questions about some other things uh, a little bit later. Um, um, right now, what do you see as the biggest challenge facing photography? I don't know that I'm qualified to answer that, to be honest. Um, I, I, I don't. I'm just, I'm just one photographer from Belfast. Um, I okay. I, I really don't know. Um, what do you? What do you see? Um, I personally think one of the biggest challenges at the moment is is probably climate change. For landscape photographers in particular, um, but I, I think that's that, that's probably you know too big a problem to delve in too much today. But you know, the for for me, I think one of the important things landscape photographers can do is to bring attention to some of the issues that you know climate change is uh, sort of brought up. And you know, for me, that that's probably one of the one of the most important things a landscape photographer you know. Um, should be not necessarily thinking about all the time, but you know, working awesome. towards you know bringing attention to to some of those uh, some of those issues. Yeah, I don't I don't know that I'm achieving that myself. You know, it's, but I I definitely think it's something that's uh, that that's worth adding our voice. You know, in the uh, in the, the the overall conversation. What's your favourite thing about being a photographer? Um, produce some work that you're proud of, you know. Um, producing an image that, that you're personally proud of, like, um, it's nice. Social media, as I said, said, it's nice when you get likes or comments. Don't get me wrong, everybody likes that, but you take it with a pinch of salt. It's nice to get a print sale, that's lovely. Um, yeah. Because somebody likes your work enough it's not you. Um, it's going to put it on the wall. Um, it's nice to win something. Yeah, the, that every time I talk about that, uh, we're a landscape photographer 2022. There's a big smile on my face, and every time my wife mentions it, I get a big smile on my face because <laughs> I never thought anything like that would happen to me. Like you know, but you know you're good and stuff, but you don't think one of those conversations will land on your doorstep, kind of thing, or sure. Kind of could listen to different different judges or on a, same judges on a different day could have picked one of the other fifty stunning images, but I got lucky. Um, but producing images that I'm proud of is my is what I. That's why I'm a photographer. That's why I do it. I do I produce work for me first and foremost. If I like it, then that's that's me happy. You know. So yeah, um, yeah. me get if somebody could ask me now whether. I would want to produce an image that I'm 100% happy with and I personally love and I love for a lot of years, or would I produce a, a good image that's going to sell for a couple of thousand pounds? I'd pick the first one. I'd, I'd want one that I'm happy with. So I, I do it for me, first and foremost. So to produce work that I'm proud of would be my um, my goal. And that's what I do. Yeah, fantastic. What's the least favourite thing about being a photographer? Hmm. Not getting out with a newborn, um, okay. not having a camera van, having a few jobs. And <laughs> no, the, 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 not the constant, but the, the regular visits to long, or further away locations when you don't get what you want, um, image wise. Um, but again, that has positives too, because when you do get that image, you know, it makes it all worth it. You, you realize the struggle you went through to make the image. It's not just you don't turn up and get an image first time every time. Um, these sort of things, expensive gear, salt water. Is not messing <laughs> that gear. That, that's 
bring a bit of humor to the podcast. Like there, there's there's a long time that I couldn't uh, I couldn't uh, have a joke about that incident, you know. So um, yeah. and have a joke about it. Now I was wearing waders that day, so I had to go back to that story. So if I went into the water, I wasn't coming back out because yeah, the, the water was yeah it was it was pretty bad. You know, yeah. I put myself in some risky positions to get an image before, and I have an actual video of about two minutes before that wave came in, took me off my feet, and there was it looked like there was no danger. Like I was in the same spot for twenty minutes to half an hour. It didn't look um, accidents on location. Uh, yeah, um, it's an expensive hobby, and another thing as well. Like um, I don't think a lot of people have taken the consideration is we drive away to these faraway locations, like everything's on the increase, like fuel, diesel, petrol, it's on yeah, the increase. Yeah. It's like it is an expensive passion, you know, and um some some people that aren't doing it, you know, don't even wouldn't even think of that, you know. Yeah, no, don't I, but, totally but, 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 but again, like all of that's gone. So when you get the shot in the back of the camera and you and you see it on a big print, who cares? You have yeah. thought what you did for, you know. That's why that's, I live. that's why that's why that's why I spend all my money on gear that I probably only half know how to use because like as I said before like I'm not in the gear I don't have to have the the best cam on the market like I shoot with the 5D Mark IV at the moment but I do want to upgrade yeah uh, very 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 soon um but um I don't have to it's just so that I know like when I when I print my work it's going to be of a, of a good standard you know um yeah. but like I don't get bogged down with sort of the technicalities of gear and all of this, you know, again, going back to mood and emotion, my photography is driven by that, not by settings and all this kind of stuff, you know, yeah. I'm not one of them. What do you uh, like to do when you're not out shooting? Uh, listen to music, uh, hold my son on my chest, um, Netflix, yeah, that's a great feeling there. Uh, yeah, it is, yeah. It won't last for long because he's he's pretty tall. I'm six foot three. My wife's like by eleven, so he, he's gonna outgrow my chest uh length quite soon. So I'll get all that while I can. Um yeah. and there'll be plenty of time to shoot after. Um family time, um, gigs, travel. But mm -hmm. the travel again goes back to photography, like a lot of a lot of our destinations will be geared towards me getting certain images. Which my wife is amazing at, at, you know, she's very, uh, very forgiving that way, you know. <laughs> yeah, I think that I think that's a very important thing as uh, a forgiving partner for uh, photographers, either that or another photographer. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Well, like when we were in City Weeks, this is how good my wife is. We were in Amsterdam back in 2019, I think. Mm -hmm. um september 19 and there was a certain ship that i wanted and i went a couple of times and wasn't getting it i was a canal and i wanted light trails of the the boats going past and stuff yep and my wife was uh we got there before sunset and we went over and there's a small window in september where you can get the shot before it goes too dark and the street lights are too bright and it's just you can't get it all in the one image and i like to get all, everything in the one exposure. I don't do multiple exposures and all of that stuff. So um, we went into the wee restaurant across the way and I was like, I'm not going to be able to order anything. Number one, I'm really picky eater and I won't eat anything here, although it's a lovely restaurant. Number two, if I order anything, even a Diet Coke, I'm going to miss my shot here. So she is a saint and she stayed and she sat in the head on her own while I was across at this across wow. the street <laughs> shooting. Yeah, so that's, that's how amazing she is. So um, that shot, uh, that shot. A braver man night. than I. <laughs> uh, yeah, yeah, thank God I got a, thank God I got a shot that night. And she's brilliant with Google Maps and all. See me with technology, as I said, I'm not in the gear and all that. I, I couldn't find my way in the Belfast city centre. So, she's uh, my eyes and ears when we went city race and stuff. She's, she's the brains and I'm the creative side. Yeah, uh, fair enough. What tips of, of what? Sorry. What's one tip that you have for somebody that's just starting out in landscape photography? Look at good work. Um, look at work that inspires you. And you might think it's out of reach, but, but keep looking at that work and um, keep striving to sort of reach those levels. Uh, you could join a local camera club. I, I'm pretty sure they have them in all over the world, um, yeah. but I know it's not for everybody, but. It's good. It's great to get that one-on-one -on -one stuff. Like when I joined the camera club, I was mentored, and 
I think two years ago, I, I started mentoring people as well because I get as much enjoyment out of them getting a good image and, and winning a, a competition in the comic club as I would have of winning something. So, um, soak, soak, soak things up, take on board what people with more experience are saying and, and be like a sponge. You know, that sounds like it's a cliche, but honestly, like that's the way you improve. If you think everything think, you do is amazing. Yeah, I, I, you know, I think it's important. Yeah, I think that's the most important thing. Look constantly, look at good stuff and and um, and be inspired. You know, look at the best, and you know, if if you put your mind to it, you can reach a certain level. I don't care what anybody says. Definitely. Um, are there any photographers out there you think I should be talking to? I mentioned uh, that I was inspired by a lot of UK photographers. Neil Burnell, I'm sure you know Neil Burnell's work. Yep. Uh, well, he's he's like a he's a world leader with class as a world class photographer. Uh, Rachel Tallybart. Um, yeah. I know this is landscape photography world, but my favorite photographer is actually um, Maria Sparbova. Okay, um, yeah. Do you know her? Do you know her work? I, I know some of her work. I don't know her personally. She, she did. No, no, I don't know her personally. There, what she did, she's amazing. Um, she's unbelievable. Like, have a couple of her books and stuff like a swimming pool series and stuff. Yeah. Um, I'd love to hear her speak about work because I've, I've heard Neil Burnell and I've heard Rachel Talibur on podcasts before, but she doesn't do landscape photography. So, but that's important to be inspired by other stuff other than just what you shoot. Like, it's funny. Yeah, I, 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 absolutely. I don't know why. I don't know why she's my favorite photographer. Well, I do. I love her images. Um, they're just yeah, they're just so clean in the colors and the, the tone and stuff. Um. And some of her stuff would be score crops as well, actually. Um, but Neil, Neil Burnell would be amazing to get on the podcast. Or Rachel Tallyboard's just they're a class above. Yeah, thanks for that. I've got one more um, uh, question for you. And for some people that listen, it's the most important question I can ask. Do you like pineapple on pizza? No chance. My wife does? No, no, no. <laughs> It's a ham, ham, peppers, ham, pepper, sweet corn, and it has to be thin and crispy. Sweet I'm very picky. Okay. <laughs> oh, <laughs> I'm, a, I'm definitely a thin and crispy guy. I can't can't do the the thick crust. Do you, do you like do you like pineapple and sweet corn? Uh, if, sorry, do you like pineapple and pizza? I, I I won't order it myself, uh, but if it's there and you know, um, why not? But uh, yeah, I won't I won't pick it off like some people. <laughs> right. Well. Okay. So. Yeah, if I'm ordering a pizza, it's like a small pizza, my wife's ordering a small pizza, and mine would have ham, peppers, sweet corn, and hers would have pineapple, peppers, and sweet corn, and she's not eating all of hers. I will pick off the pineapple and eat her, the rest of hers. <laughs> but you can still taste the pineapple, so it's still a bit wrong. <laughs> hot, hot and cold doesn't go. It has no. Why yeah. ask that question? I like if if it, the pineapple's on it, it's got to be hot. It can't be cold. Yeah, yes, yeah. No, that's still wrong. The texture, no. No. Oh, okay. Fair enough. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you very much for taking the time to talk to me today, Paul. Um, it's been wonderful getting to know you a little bit better and uh, getting to know some of your work. Where can people find what you do? Um, social media, um, Twitter at P Colleen. Nobody will know how to spell it because I can't pronounce it. Photo, um, Paul Colleen Photography on um, Instagram and the same on Twitter, but I don't really use it. And I've obviously my website as well, www.paulcolleenphotography.com. Um, but yeah, my name, my, my surname's a, is a weird one, so I don't think anybody's going to come find me now. <laughs> That's all right. I'll put links to everything in the in the show notes. So hopefully, uh, you you might get an, uh, another few followers. Make sure you make sure you spell the surname correctly. <laughs> Absolutely, you pronounce it correctly anyway. So fair play. All right. Thanks very much, mate. Thank you, man. Cheers. Thanks again for listening to Landscape Photography World. I hope you enjoyed the show and keep listening because I'll be joined by some great guests in upcoming episodes. You can find my work and this podcast at grantswinburnphotography.com. I'm also on Instagram, Twitter, YouTube and Facebook. I'm Grant Swinburne. Hope to see you out shooting soon. <laughs>